you would, to Matthew chapter 11. And I have to say that our brother Tyrone did not know that I'm going to preach on the verse that he opened up the uh, service with, Matthew, that tremendous gospel um, promise in the gospel of Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to pick up reading in verse 25, and I'm going to read through verse 30. So Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to, he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There is, I think, spiritual value in revisiting some of what we would call our simple gospel truths. Because as you know, simple gospel truths are never fully fathomed fully understood, and a simple gospel truth, such as this invitation by our Lord, when we revisit it after years, perhaps, of other learning and other experiences that God has had with us, even simple gospel truths can take on deeper meaning. More understanding is gained, and our response to it can be something that would glorify the Lord. This invitation, as it's been called, is not only profitable when we first trusted in the Lord, perhaps even some here today came into the faith through the preaching of this particular promise, or as it was shared with you from a friend or a neighbor or an evangelist. But this gospel invitation, as you probably are aware, is holds out blessing not just for a first-time believer, but for the saint of God, because there is a sustainability in what our Lord said here, a, a, a growability, if that is a word, where the, the, this promise becomes more full and more rich. So I'd like to consider with you this passage, actually mostly just from chapter, from verse 28, under four headings. First of all, I'd like to look at the context with you. And the context, there's, there's two building blocks that this invitation is built on. And we, we always miss those. And, and for my money, those two gospel foundational building blocks that set the context of this enrich this promise like no other. So we'll look at those. Secondly, we'll look at his phrase, Cub unto me. Come unto me, and we'll look at, at three or four subpoints under this thought where he says, come unto me. Thirdly, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And lastly, where he says, I will give you rest. In the context, Jesus had spoken in verses 20 through 24 about human responsibility. And as you know, he also spoke about uh, those that rejected him when he says he, that these truths have been hidden from, from the wise and the prudent but revealed to babes. He's, he's illuminating something that he had just spoken about where his, his simple truths uh, perhaps were too simple for the scribes and the Pharisees and those that did not want to receive him. But there's two foundational truths that I want to speak about that 
come from verse 27. And the first one has to do with the fact that Christ had unbreakable, intimate, deep fellowship and communion with his son. There, there, was, an, there was, there is, an unbreakable union between the Father and the Son. Something that began in eternity past, when, whenever that was, something that will go on to eternity future, something that is so strong, so, so deep, because you have the character and the nature of Christ, who is God, and God the Father intermixed, Christ laying in the bosom of the Father, um, this communion and union that is so purposeful, one purpose being man's redemption because of Christ, so so close between the Father and the Son, who, who know all spiritual mysteries, all relational values, uh, holiness, glory, intense knowledge, divine attributes, all of these things <coughs> mixed together in this union so deep that man, us, we cannot understand it. We cannot know it. So he says in ver the middle of verse 27, no man knoweth the Son but the Father, and neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son. So, so with just that phrase, we understand that, that it is excluding everybody except the Father and the Son in this communion. Spiritual mysteries, the depth of wisdom and knowledge. Try, try to imagine just for a minute, and I'm, I'm trying to get to the point here, but try to imagine the fellowship and the union between the Godhead, principally God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the heart of God. Christ, who, who himself uh, is the express image of his person. And, and this is like a locked box. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son. It's a locked box. And then the key. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The redeemed have for them, we talked about this a few weeks ago, God is incomprehensible and yet he's knowable. The redeemed have, have this box unlocked for them by Christ because Christ reveals the Father to us. He has made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Now the foundation block that the invitation is built on is not just to give you rest, rest from your labor, rest from your burden. The invitation, one of the building blocks of the invitation is he wants to reveal God to you. He wants you to come to him so he can unlock the box and he can reveal who God the Father is. He can reveal the Son. He can reveal these spiritual mysteries, the, the purpose of life, the meaning of time, what heaven's all about. We, we always think, because we're selfish, we, we always think about the gospel invitation that God is rescuing us, which, which he is. And he's paying the price for sins, which he is. But in the same way, Abraham sent his servants to get a bride for the son of promise. The gospel is going out to get the bride of Christ. So Christ's life can be shared. We sang about it. The life of Christ, all I have is Christ. His life from his vantage point can be shared with the believer. This is one of the beauties of this invitation. It's based upon the desire of the Godhead, the Godhead who holds such impenetrable 
uh, tight, unattainable communion, that Christ can reveal something of that to a lost people. You are highly favored, highly blessed as a believer to be brought into this company who will know something of God. It's not held out, Jesus had said this in verse 25, not held out for the self-sufficient, the self-righteous, those who are trying to merit, but those who would come unto him as children. I think Christ must have been filled with such emotion. Think about Christ in the midst of this context. He's been misjudged. He's been rejected. He's mis misunderstood. The people rejected him and his message. They wanted to have nothing to do with Christ. And now Christ wants to reveal himself, and he's going to say, come unto me. And people will come unto him and believe and trust. That's the first foundational block that we have to consider. This invitation will not return void. It's going to come back. It's going to reveal uh, the hearts of people, and some are going to come and believe and trust. And this invitation is based upon God's desire to reveal himself. No man knows the Father except the Son. And no man knows the Son except the Father, the locked box, and then the key. And to he whomsoever the Son will reveal him, so come unto me, is what he's saying, so I can reveal myself and the Father to you. Secondly, this invitation is based upon the Lordship of Christ. Again, verse 27, he said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Just like Matthew 28, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Here he says, All things have been delivered unto me of my Father. This is speaking about his Lordship. And your ability and your opportunity to come to him can be traced to his lordship. And the rest that he is going to give you and sustain, that can be traced to his lordship. The ability to learn of him, to find rest for your souls, can be traced back to his lordship. We see the lordship here of Christ in this invitation and we, and we see that these four things that I just mentioned, it's made by the one who not only can speak such of a thing, but has the power, has the power to give these such things. The invitation was not given by Moses. If, if this invitation had been given by Moses, we would think of some connection with the law, and, and we would have to, have to keep the law, and, and that's, that's a lose-lose proposition. If, the prop, if this invitation was given by Abraham, would have to think, okay, he's the father of the faithful. We have to have a super abounding faith. But I'm coming on day one. What kind of faith do I have now? If this invitation was given by David, we would think we're going to have to be all spun up with zeal like David, who was always accomplishing so much. I'm a babe. I know nothing as I come. If the invitation was given by the Apostle Paul, who was so smart, didactic teaching, able to fit all the scriptures together in a spiritually symmetrical, logical way, we wouldn't have the knowledge to respond to that kind of an invitation. But it's made by Jesus Christ himself, the Lord of all, who can speak this kind of a word. So those two foundational stones... Christ is giving this invitation based on the fact that he wants to reveal himself to his own, and it's built upon the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, this phrase, come unto me. Come unto me. Just a wonderful gospel invitation, as many of the invitations in the gospel are. We equate coming to Christ with with trusting in him, believing in him, abandoning ourselves to him, taking his yoke upon ourselves, the simultaneous event where the scales fall off of our eyes, our heart is opened, 
He grants saving faith. He grants repentance unto life. And we come to him in that, in that first step. For some of us, we can perhaps pinpoint a day. Others of us cannot, but we know the season. And we've seen the work that he has done. But we have this, this childlike faith being persuaded that what he promises us, he's able to perform. Come unto me. I want to say a few things about this phrase when he says, come unto me. The first thing we have to say is, it's a command. It's a command from the Lord. We, we've hinted at this. His lordship is displayed. All power has been given to me. The Father has committed all things into my hand. And now I say, come. I've seen, I'm going to say trashy, trashy religious art that will have this scripture, come unto me. And it's, it's typically a scene, whether it's a painting or on a coffee cup or a bumper sticker. And there's some very innocuous, vanilla, bland scene where, where, where it, it seems so harmless. And it seems like, well, you can come unto me or you don't have to come unto me. It's not the way Jesus said this. It's a direct statement. It's not an if-then statement. He does not provide options. Remember Joshua? Joshua said, choose this day who you choose, who you Choose this day who you will serve. If the gods on the other side of the flood are gods, the Ammonites, said, go ahead and serve them. I'm going to serve the Lord. Or Elijah. Remember Elijah said, this is the same type of thing. But here Jesus said, come unto me. And it's a command that has with it the power to come, the power to believe, saving faith. He speaks with authority. He speaks with a desired purpose. And when you hear these words and, and you understand the intention and the purposes God puts on them, and he says, come unto me, you must come. You will come. You have to come. You're compelled to come. You want to come, despite any perceived cost. When we look at this today, we sit here as believers in this comfortable room and we look at these scribes and these Pharisees and we know what the gospel entails, what it saves us from, what it will be for us in the future. We think about making an excuse or ignoring it or delaying a response or modifying what Christ said or arguing with him. And we think that's just silly. It's pointless. He said, come. In verse 3, in verse 19, he says, the coming of the Messiah. <coughs> Is the coming of the Messiah delayed? Are there excuses for it? Is it ignored? Is it modified? No. The coming of the Messiah will happen. And it's the same idea. Come unto me. So these words are a command. Secondly, these words, we have to understand, they have an urgency to them. When he said, come, he meant now. He meant today. If you're familiar with the Gospels, there were many places where Christ went, and he only went there one time. And his word was only spoken, or miracles were only done one time on one dusty road, or in one synagogue, or in somebody's house. That same urgency. This is the time to respond. A few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, we looked at Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. He agonizes. He strives. He, he earnestly. And that's the idea of this come. It means now. Come now. One quote from Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards said, Such a manner of seeking the kingdom of God, seeking the Savior, 
that is the earnestness, the striving, it's necessary to prepare people for the kingdom of God. Such earnestness, thoroughness of endeavors is the ordinary means that God uses to equip people to come into the kingdom, to acquaint people with their own hearts, their helplessness, and their despair. And he goes on to say, and what that does is once they're in the kingdom, it gives to them a joyful heart, a thankful heart. They realize that this spiritual prize was worth agonizing, striving, being in earnest to get. So there is a sense of urgency. There's that sense of seriousness, solemnity, soberness. There really is this now is the accepted time environment that this is given in, given the fact that this is a life and death issue, given the fact that God in his sovereign rule, an unsaved man is a lawbreaker, treading on God's earth, not living according to, to God's way, which is why he says, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled just a little. Given the fact that this, this change that will occur in a believer, being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, a new heart. Given the fact that there, the, none of us, life is so uncertain, none of us knows whether we will be here tomorrow or not. Given the absolute blessedness that awaits those who come to Christ, given the fact that, that Christ is, is the one who is the, called the desire of all nations, he's the very one who wants not just, not just to save us, but to bring us into fellowship with him, a loving relationship that will last for all of eternity. There is this urgency in this word, come unto me. Other places in the gospel, uh, you, uh, gospel, Narrative used this word compel. Remember the parable of the Great Supper. And that parable uses the word, you have to compel them to come in. Again, Luke says, to strive to enter in at the straight gate. Um, Isaiah says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. God has spoken. There's this time element. The, the action is required is to be in earnest, to strive, to seek, to ask, to knock. And along with this promise, Jesus grants the power to believe. He grants repentance unto life. He, he grants this, these new eyes and new ears to see what it's all about. Even to babes. We, we read that it's been revealed to babes. So we can't have the excuse that we can't have any other excuse. I did not know enough. It really is true that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's even committed unto us this word of reconciliation. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Next we say, when he says, come unto me, we have to be reminded that the object of our faith is the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. When he says, come unto me, the implication is that we rest on not theological dogma, however precious and dear, however orthodox and true, but we rest upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very often we can be perhaps unknowingly resting on other things along with the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ saved us to be believers, not to be parts of, of movements or church, parts of churches or denomination as our badge, unthinking, irrational zombies, 
uh, going along with the majority because the majority must be right. He saved us to believe upon him. Every ounce of our belief is focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not say, come unto the law, come unto historic Christianity, come unto the church fathers, come unto this system or that system or the other system, come unto a second blessing because the first blessing wasn't blessed enough, come unto the temple, the ordinances, religious pragmatism. He said, come unto me. And that's the great difference between Christ and all these other things. Christ will never disappoint you. Churches will disappoint you. Pastors and teachers will disappoint you. Uh, you read the church fathers or the Puritans and you think, wow, they're so great. And then you read something and say, well, wow, I didn't know they believed that. They missed the boat on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Doctrine, whatever man touches will be imperfect. And you will be disappointed. You will never be disappointed in Christ. That's why Job could say, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Sorry, I think I grabbed the wrong page here. He will never disappoint you. The promise that he's going to give us, rest, rest from the burdens, rest for our souls, that promise, as believers, we know there is this constant, fulfilling of it, though we go through trials, spiritual warfare, sicknesses, longevity in the faith, which brings its problems, peaks and values. The gospel invitation, when you believe, when you became a born-again believer, this promise is just as true today as it was then. I was reminded of an Old Testament parallel. I think it's a parallel uh, in the case of Joseph, after Joseph went through all of the trials that he had gone through, sold by his brethren, cast into prison, eventually becoming the prime minister, second in command in Egypt, his family came into Egypt to buy food. He revealed himself to them. There was still a famine in the land. It's, it's going to happen. And he said to his brothers, come unto me. And I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. Do not regard your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And so Joseph's brethren actually came into Egypt. They came with some apprehension because they had sinned against Joseph. But if you follow the narrative through until the end of that book of Genesis, and you realize there were difficulties. Now they were living as strangers in a strange land. They encountered all the affairs of life, births and deaths and sicknesses and afflictions and discomforts. They did feel the effects of the great famine, although they were taken care of. They fought bitterness of soul, probably thinking, oh, if we only had done this or if we only had done that, what might have been? They felt the infirmity of the flesh. Maybe they felt jealousy from the Egyptians towards them. But despite all of this, when Joseph said, come unto me and I will take care of you, in fact, they were taken care of. They were given grace in the eyes of the ruler of Egypt. They were spared the, the outcome of that tremendous famine. They were spared the outcome of sinning that great sin against Joseph because he forgave them with a godly forgiveness. They were provided for. They did not move into the palace then, but they were provided for. They could have an audience with the king at any time. 
because of their relationship with Joseph. Everything that Joseph said when he said, come unto me, was provided for them freely. And so for you today as a believer, the word of Jesus, it's an abiding truth. It's a daily truth, as powerful for us today as when we first believed. And like the brethren of Joseph, it's not always a Sunday school picnic. I mean, we're strangers living in a strange land. We encounter the everyday effects of life, births, deaths, afflictions, discomforts. Bitterness of soul. Oh, if only I had believed 10 years before I did. I've relayed the story, our good friend uh, who has since gone on to be with the Lord, he did not become a Christian until his late 50s. And he would say, why didn't I believe when I was a teenager? And then he would catch himself and say, well, somehow it's in the providence of God. Praise God, at least I became a believer before I passed away. We feel the effects of sin, the infirmity of the flesh, flesh persecution. But despite all of these things, when he said, come unto you and I will give you rest, rest for your souls, that in fact unless God's a liar, which he's not, that in fact has been true for you. You have been taken care of. You've been given grace in the eyes of the ruler of the land. I'm talking about our heavenly ruler. Through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, you've been granted freedom of conscience, liberty of soul. You haven't moved into the palace yet, but it's waiting for you. You can have an audience with the king at any time. Come unto me. It's an abiding truth for the believer as well. Thirdly and quickly, he provides rest. He says, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Laboring and being laden. Linguists tell us that there's an active voice and a passive voice in this phrase to show an all-encompassing truth for all of mankind. It's a universal truth that applies to all men. And what it's signifying is lading down a ship to the point that it has to sink, or putting so much of a burden on a beast that the beast can't move. Lading something to the point where it breaks. This, this word is often used being uh, a laboring and being laden on spiritual burdens. Speaking of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus said, for they bind heavy burdens that are grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders. Or again in the book of Acts, chapter 15, um, Essentially, the Holy Spirit saying, Now why are you tempting God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Cannot bear it. This laboring. Christ wants to give us rest from the labor that we can't perform anyway. It's too heavy. Interestingly enough, that verse in Psalm 90 that talks about our life, the days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, what? Labor and sorrow. And our life is soon cut off and we fly away. Being burdened, that's the laboring, being burdened includes all the burdens of a guilty conscience, sin, fear of death, uncertainty of life. And today in our society, I think if the, the New Testament saints could be transported here, they would, they would say, this society is moving at such of a mock speed. How are you, brethren, able to survive? There's so much going on in this type of a society with everything moving at breakneck, breakneck speed. speed. And everything the world bombards us with, ambition and greed and oppression and carnal care and unfulfilled dreams and having to pay our bills and, and the cost of living and work and careers and homeschooling and my car keeps breaking down and I have these bad neighbors and the news is always bad and 
and all of all of this this being burdened which i think is is especially true in this century this time period man that is born man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble job said again laboring the active voice the passive voice too much going on that we cannot support it we cannot carry it and you're being deceived if you think i can carry it and i can please god through my own righteousness and i can come out on the other side and god will bless me because i pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and i did it all of the effects of sin, all of the effects of the world, whatever it might be. <coughs> Jesus is saying, forget that. There's another way. Come unto me. There's another way. Very often in the gospel, we have this contrast. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. That way is hard. But Jesus said, but I am the way to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jeremiah said, your own wickedness will correct you and your backsliding will reprove you. But then God also says, but I will heal their backsliding and I will love them freely. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the prodigal son can come to his senses and realize that being a servant, being yoked with God's yoke, is a much better way. Laboring and laden, Christ wants to give us rest from those. The effects of the world, but primarily the effects of sin that beat up people. And then fourthly and lastly, it says, he gives rest there are actually two rests that are focused on in this passage the first rest comes at regeneration verse 28 come unto me the gospel invitation all you that labor and are heavy laden you can't do it and i will give you rest sin offers passing pleasures for a season it brings forth death but Jesus promises rest. The world offers attainments and fame and fulfillment, but the world delivers vanity and vexation of spirit. And Jesus promises rest. The enemy, enemy of your soul would offer to you that you can become great. You can, you can eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods. Jesus says, the enemy of your soul was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. I am the one who will give you rest. Society promises so many things, and it always fails. This great contradiction in Scripture of what could be promised and what is realized compared to Christ, who always fulfills this promise of a peace that passes understanding and rest. Again, this contrast, I, the Lord, create the fruit of the lips, and I give peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near. But the wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest. No rest there, it cannot rest. The waters are kicking up mire and dirt. Rest principally for the soul, verse 29 but it's not at the exclusion of rest that permeates our existence. Isn't it true that there can be outward rest, prosperity, finances, freedom from sickness, trials, earthly interruptions? Um, there could be this outward appearance of peace, but inwardly our soul can be ratcheted up with great conflicts and turmoil and warfare and no peace with God. And yet on the other hand, 
The world can be falling down around us. Think of the Apostle Paul, shipwreck, trials, imprisonment, stripes, accusation, dishonor, poverty, sorrow, bonds and afflictions. But he had an inner joy, an inner rest, an inner assurance, peace, rest that did not fail. Rest from the works of the law. Rest from trying to merit righteousness in God's sight. Rest from the vanities and the empty promises of this world. Paul said, though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day with this soul rest. Verse 28 is the first rest, rest at regeneration. But notice also verse 29, rest at being yoked up. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you ever stop to think about the rest that comes with being a servant of Christ? Having his yoke put upon me, where there is that, that obedience and that love, and you're delivered from the unrest of self-will and the unrest of contending desires and you don't know which master you're going to serve that day. There's a rest in submission to Christ. There is a rest and a peace when you, you abdicate control of your own life and you say, God, take, take the reins. Rule and guide me. Tell me what thou wants me to do. I'm surrendering and I want your yoke on me. Not my will be done, but thine be done. Jesus did say, learn of me. Again, this gets back to that, that fellowship aspect where he wants to reveal. But learn of me, Christ, as the, as, the, as, as the chief servant, the servant of all. Learn of me. It's, it's a secret of tranquility, of peace. We're done with our own earthly passions and desires and disquietness and, and problems and issues. And we want to be meek and lowly like the master and have him guide, lead, and direct us. This promise is not just a gospel invitation and a gospel promise. It's for the believer as well. Let me close just by reading this again. Jesus said, all things, that's everything, all things have been delivered unto me by my Father. And no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. I'm going to add the word so. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Father, thank you for your word. What tremendous words that have eternal prospect for your own. Father, we ask simply today that this promise would be reinvigorated to our souls. Lord, that it would become new light, and new truth, as it were, to guide us in the way in which we should go. Thank you for this Lord's Day, for this opportunity to worship. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.